Would you turn back to Philippians in chapter 1? Verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he has, who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, and we saw this morning that this next clause could be translated, it's because you have me in your heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. And now that he comes to his heart towards them, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that the, the, the scriptures are your spoken word written down. And, and who can know the mind of God except the Spirit of God? Who can know then the meaning of these words apart from the Spirit who inspired these words? And so therefore we're conscious this evening of our utter dependence upon the aid and assistance of the Holy Spirit. Would we not be like the Pharisees and the scribes and so many who hear the word of God, ears but not hearing and eyes but not seeing? We pray, O oh Father, that you would give us hearts that see and hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, my text this evening is verse 8. We considered verse 7 this morning. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. We saw this morning that Paul was able to say that the reason he was confident concerning the Philippians' position as Christians, their, their true experience of God's grace, the reason he was able to know that God had worked in them, is working in them, and will always work in them, was the fact that they had shown him commitment, and that commitment to him was ultimately an expression of their commitment to Jesus Christ. So he speaks of their heart towards him as a great assurance of their heart towards Christ. But now he speaks of his heart towards them. If this morning's sermon was a sermon which was titled The uh, Congregation's Love for a Preacher, we might say that this evening's is The Preacher's Love for a Congregation. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Now, perhaps you're thinking, you may not be thinking, but it's certainly possible you may be thinking, I am not a pastor. And so therefore, why do I need to hear a sermon about a pastor's love for a congregation? Isn't that what you should do, pastor? And therefore, can't you just skip that bit and move on? Well, maybe you like the idea of hearing what I should do so you can remind me of what I should do. <laughs> which is not a bad thing if I fall short of that, which I do. Um, but no, there's a more important reason why you should hear this, because a pastor's not called to a special kind of love that you're exempt from. Do you realise that, Christian? Take the qualifications for a pastor. Is it that the pastor's meant to be those things and the other Christians don't have to bother about those things? By no means. Self-control, managing your home well, all the things that are described of a pastor should be pursued by all God's people. It's just that it, as a pastor, they're non-negotiable. They must be there. Here, the heart that Paul expresses for the Philippians is simply the heart that all God's people should have for one another. And so therefore, there's great instruction. That's why I read to you from John chapter 15. Because the Lord Jesus Christ says, As I have loved you, you also love one another. And so Paul's heart for them is simply him loving them as Christ has loved him. And therefore, as God's people, 
he's witnessing and getting an insight into what was going on in Paul's soul towards the Philippians, we see what is our Christian duty uh, towards one another. Now, remember, we have been considering, and I've mentioned this often, that Paul was held up as an example Christian, an exemplar Christian, if that's the right word. Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so Paul here, hope giving you a window into the affection he has for the Philippians, you see what we are called to as saints of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, Paul affirms this very reality when he sees it in other people. For example, if you turn over to chapter 2, in verse 20 and 21, he speaks of Timothy. Now we know that Paul had a very instrumental role in Timothy's life. Timothy was raised in the fear of God by Lois and his grandmother. But Paul no doubt came there, whether Paul was instrumental in his conversion or whether he was converted and Paul just took him alongside and fathered him and discipled him. We can't be definitely sure, but we know that Paul and Timothy had a father-son relationship. Listen to what Paul says as Timothy. I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your saints. A sincere care, a loving concern, a loving heart, for all seek their own. Everyone else seeks their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. And then I mentioned to you Epaphroditus this morning. Look at verses 25 to 26, particularly verse 26. He was longing for you all. If this was their pastor, what we can see is that what was in Paul was also in their pastor. He was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. sick. So therefore, just a, well, by way of introduction, pastor's heart for this congregation should be the heart we should all, with much prayer and the Spirit's work in our life, be seeking to cultivate. And obviously, as we saw from Ephesians, this is something that only God can do. But as we saw last week, we pray for things that God does in our lives. Well then, firstly, you see with me, a faithful pastor is not a hireling. A faithful pastor is not a hireling. Now, what is a hireling? Well, a hireling is someone who does what he does simply because he's got to, to earn some money. A hireling is someone who does what he does and has responsibility simply so he can get his paycheck at the end of the month. That is a hireling. And Jesus referred to a hireling, didn't he, in John chapter 10. Jesus said, John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, there's that word, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. And Paul is the very opposite to a hireling here. Do you see that? For God is my witness. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. He doesn't write to them, care for them, simply because he has to. Simply because the Holy Spirit prompted him and inspired him alone to write these things to him. Granted, the Holy Spirit inspired him. But he longed, longed for them. He cared for them. He was doing this because he loved them. He was willingly serving them with a loving and affectionate and tender heart. This might be a bit of a, a trivial illustration. It's always hard thinking of illustrations to illustrate spiritual reality because you always feel like you're lessening it. But I guess that's the point. It's only an illustration, right? But I remember when I was at Bible college, um, when I started Bible college, someone had bought me a nice leather goatskin bound Bible and I was really happy with it. And I took it into my lectures and I was really proud and I put it on my desk and I was really excited to use it. And then this Welshman came in, this lecturer, and he says, oh, Tom, I forgot my Bible, can I borrow yours? And I was like, uh, all right, <laughs> you know, gave it to him. Well, he was page turning like this, and scrumpling it up, and slamming it on the table, and I mean, he didn't even treat his own heart back one like that when he brought it in. He was wrecking it. And at the end of the lecture, he puts it in, there you are, there's your Bible back. You see, it wasn't his own. It wasn't his own. He did not care that someone had uh, given me the funds to buy this. He did not care. And, and, and that's what a hireling is. And that's what Paul isn't. 
That's what a true pastor isn't. A true pastor, and, and indeed, by extension, as I've been saying, all the lost people should care for one another as if they are own flesh and blood. There should be a heart of genuine longing and concern, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. The sheep of Christ, they mean the world to him, don't they? We know that our Lord longed for his people to be with him. He really likes his people, by the way. He longs for their company. He longs for their presence. He longs for their salvation. He prays for their songs. He sympathises with his people in their sickness and their sufferings and their afflictions and their temptations. He grieves in his heart at the sufferings that his people go through. He grieves at Lazarus' death and, his future, and, and the grief that the people are experiencing. Jesus wept, it says. This is the saviour of God's people. This is the saviour of sinners. And Paul says, I long for you all with the affection that is in Christ Jesus. He longs for the death of his people's sin to be removed. He longs for his church to be presented without blemish before his father. This is the longing Christ has for his sheep. And this is the longing that any pastor should have for his sheep. And by extension, this is the longing we should have for one another. As I have loved you, you also love one another. Now, this is not a given, and this was not always the case. And sadly, too often, even today, this is not the case. And I'm sure many of you know that by experience. But we know that in Exodus, Ezekiel 34, God lamented the state of Israel's shepherds. Listen to these shocking words. Like Ezekiel 34, the word of God came to me saying, verse 1, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. I have a personal example of this once. church was being asked to double tithe and to pay for various things that needed to be done in the building. And then we find out that out of the church expenses, various of the pastors went on a holiday to Dubai to play golf. <coughs> nice, isn't it? Everyone else is double tithing and working really hard whilst you go and have a lavish holiday and play some golf. This is, this is true. It still happens today. People don't care about the flock. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat limbs, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill, and so on. And then later on in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, the Lord's conclusion is, I will come and shepherd for my people. I will come and seek them. I will come and bind the lame. I will come and heal the sick. I will feed the hungry. I will open the eyes of the blind. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He is saying, I have come. But that's not all the scriptures promise. The scriptures don't just promise that God will shepherd his people, but that having shepherded his people, he will provide shepherds who will also feed his people. You see this in Jeremiah chapter 3. Tremendous promises. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. I will give you shepherds according to my heart. How greatly I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Do you see the Old Testament promise fulfilled in Paul here? This isn't just a random occurrence. Paul is expressing the fulfilment of prophecy. I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Then it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increase in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made any more. At that time Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. Ephesians 4, God gave apostles and prophets some to be pastors and teachers to the church. 
that the saint might come to the fullness and stature of Jesus Christ. Here you have then a template, a fulfilment of that promise, and it's still being fulfilled in our midst today, it's still being filled in the, fulfilled in the church, and as I said, what God does, what, what must be true of every pastor, must increasingly be true of all God's people. This heart that should be fostered in a minister of the gospel should be fostered in our own heart. This affection, this care, this love. We might say then that here is a man who is not a professional. You know, I remember when I first began looking for, uh, after leaving the well, when the seminary was coming to an end and I was looking for my, the next step God wanted us to do, I was immediately put off when a church asked me for my CV. I thought, I'm not applying to this church. Because what on the earth has your secular credentials got to do with spiritual qualification, fundamentally? I will give you shepherds after my own heart. The only thing that matters is if you're biblically qualified, and if you have a call in your life, and if your heart <coughs> is the heart of an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ. And Paul was a man who didn't do it for a wage. In fact, that was one of the accusations against him, wasn't it, in the Corinthians? One of the accusations of the Corinthians is he only does this for the paycheck. So Paul said, those, the Lord commanded that those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. That is a right, but he said, I won't make use of that right. In fact, he said, in order to prove to you I don't do this from a simple, I'm not a hireling, I'm going to refrain from taking this right, and I'm going to preach the gospel free of charge. And here's a man who doesn't labour for people simply out of a sense of duty. He does so out of a willing heart. Now notice the genuineness of this. This is not mere hyperbole. For God is my witness. There can be no higher appeal you can make about the condition of your heart. For God is my witness. Here he's saying this is no mere emotion, no mere hype, no fluctuation, no feeling that come and goes. This is a genuine care that I feel within my soul, and God knows. This is the God who knows the very depths and inner workings of the soul. This is the God that Hebrews 4 says, Nothing is hidden from his sight. All are naked and exposed before the eyes of him to whom we are to give an account. And Paul is saying, when God looks in my soul, he sees this. He sees it. It's real. God is my witness. Now I think many people today will say there's no way such a sincere love and care could exist in the world towards people who perhaps aren't your flesh and blood. But Paul says, no, it's true. God is a witness of this reality. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And he repeats this desire, doesn't he, in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. This is real, real love. This is court language, isn't it? For God is my witness. I call God to my defence. That's sincerity, isn't it? And, and, and that's really the test of your sincerity and your love towards one another. Does God, could you say, God is my witness, I love you in Christ? Not perfectly. Oh, failing. I fall short of it. But God knows in my soul I care for you all. May it be true in this place. So that is then the first point. A faithful pastor is not a hiring. But now let's unpack this great longing. A faithful pastor's great longing. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now this is an astounding statement. This is an unbelievable thing to say. I long for you, I love you, I care for you, I desire you with the affection that Christ himself has for you. I can't, as I was thinking, how do you even articulate this? If you said to me, I know how you're, you feel about your wife, Tom. I would say, no, you don't. You can't begin to know how I feel about my dear wife. You have no idea how I feel. You have no idea how much I love her and how much she means to me. That is something 
but only I know. And how she feels to me for me is how something she knows, and I know by experience. To, he is claiming to know something of the love that Christ has for his people. And he is claiming to be able to love you to some degree in the way that he loves you. It's astounding. How great was that love? This was a love that brought Christ from heaven, brought him to the sinful world, a world that hated him, a world that rejected him, a world that scorned him. He, he knew the reproach of sinners. Everywhere he went, he just met hatred and hatred and hatred, opposition, opposition. He had nowhere to lay his head. He taught the most wonderful things and no one said thank you. He healed people and some of them didn't even come back to say thanks. He preached to people that wanted to throw him off a cliff. And then he allowed himself to be crucified to a block of wood. And endured the scorns of sinners. And he cried out, forgive them, they know not what they're doing, to a people who said, give us Barabbas instead of you. Away with this man. We will not have him to rule over us. Christ's love was a love that moved him to go to Calvary's cross. All the way up the hill, carrying the cross on his shoulders. It was a, it was a love that Led him to say in the garden, not my will but yours, be done. To free us from sin's penalty, to free us from sin's tyranny. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave himself for us. And Paul says, I yearn for you all. I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this wasn't just Paul. We mentioned verse 30 of chapter 2 of Epaphroditus. Who for the work of Christ came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what's lacking in your service towards me. You know something? We should be prepared to die for one another. <laughs> Paul saying, I would die for you. I would suffer for you. I would give up my life for you. I long for you with the affection that is in Jesus Christ. Wow. Now, of course, we've got to be careful here. He is not claiming to love them as fully as Christ did. As he said in Ephesians 2, you need the strength of God to even comprehend something of the love of Christ. And even then, you haven't got to the bottom of the love of Christ. Who can tell the, 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 the depth and the breadth and the, the measure of the love of Christ? It is a... It is a it is an ocean, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. It's like a vast ocean, and we're only at a paddle. We're paddling in the shallow end. And, you, you, and, and the deeper you go, you just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and there's no end to the depths of his love. You, Paul is not by any means saying, I love you exactly like he does. But he is expressing that to the degree that I've apprehended something of that love, to the degree to which I've experienced in my own soul, he loved me and he gave himself for me. I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. That is what he's saying. And this, the Greek here literally speaks of, and I think the AV still has this, I think, I didn't actually check this week, but the bowels of Jesus Christ. The Greek literally speaks of, I, I yearn for you in the bowels of Christ. You think, Ugh. <laughs> That's not a very nice image, is it? Bowels. But of course, in ancient culture, the bowels were the, regarded as the centre of affection and feeling, the guts, the place where you really feel and you really experience emotion and, and feeling. And so he is describing in language that they understood the deepest possible feeling and affection imaginable. I yearn for you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Luke translates this elsewhere as the Lord's tender mercies. He's not just his mercies, but his tender mercies. It conveys the idea that even his mercies might crush us if they were not tender mercies. This is how he feels. In fact, the Hebrew equivalent of this Greek word implies sympathy. 
Isaiah 63 and verse 15 we read look down from heaven and see your habitation holy and glorious where are your zeal and your strength here it is the yearning of your heart and your mercies towards me Jeremiah 31 verse 20 as well Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? Although I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore my heart yearns for him. Oh, he said, I yearn for you like God yearns for his people. The same yearning, the same compassion that pitied us in our sin, and the, the same sympathy that fills with us in our afflictions and in our temptations, the same grief at the prospect of our destruction. The same passion for souls which caused him to sweat drops of blood on Calvary, Paul says, is present in my own soul. To some degree at least. To some finite extent. He longs for their company. He says in this book, I want to come and see you. Do you know, Christ longs for his people. He longs for our presence. You know, oftentimes when we backslide, we sort of think, you know, how can I sort of come back? gone a long way and we sort of sort of you know, one step and just sort of edge our way forward. God isn't like that. God says, thank goodness you're back. How I've missed you. Paul says, I long for you. With the affection of Christ Jesus, I'd much rather see you than write to you. You think of our Lord when we read in Hebrews 2.13 of the Lord's desire when Jesus says, one day we'll stand before his Father. And he's going to be proud. Do you know that? Our Lord's going to be proud. Isn't he? He's going to be proud because he's going to say, Father, here am I and the children whom you have given me. I can't get my head around that. Why would he be proud to present me to him? Here they are. Look at my children. The children you've given me. And yet that's what he says. That's how he feels about us. He's proud. Not because we're good in ourselves, but because the sight of us is a reflection of his glory. His work has been so transformative. But though we're dark, we're lovely. There, there, is a, there is a comeliness and a beauty about us now in Christ. We're clothed in his righteous garments. This statement speaks of concern for them. Their needs really matter to him. Their burdens are his burdens. Their pains are his pains. Just like every grief a child of God feels is felt in the heart of our high priest. Every time you groan, it reverberates in the heart of Christ. And it reverberates in this pastor's heart here for the Philippians. And they've been separated. See, this is a genuine affection because they've been separated by distance, haven't they? Philippians is in Macedonia, Paul's in Rome. A long way away. And may have been separated for some time. And you know this, those of you who have maintained friendships with people over a distance over a long time, the great proof of a real friendship is whether it sustains and carries on despite geography, the distance of geography and, and time. And most of us, I'm sure, have those one or twos that for some reason they've just remained faithful friends. And Every now and again you speak and it's just that same care, that same affection. They ring you in a crisis and all of a sudden you feel for them. And, and here is Paul expressing great love for them, though they're far away. Now, this is a miracle, isn't it? This is a miracle of grace. Paul is saying, I yearn for the people I once persecuted. And so you say, well, they weren't existing when he was persecuting the church. I know that, but he hated everything the Christians stood for once. He was on his way to Damascus to destroy the church. He hated the name of Christ. Now he loves the people of Christ with the love of Christ. I remember <laughs> when I was at school in the sixth form, I remember the CU used to meet. And I remember they used to meet in a, one of these old 70s blocks and they were sort of glass buildings, you know, and you could see it and the CU used to meet in there. And I remember when I wasn't converted, I used to sort of like 
with my friends, you know, we laugh at them and mock them and think they're a bunch of idiots and, you know, say all, all manner of blasphemies towards them. And I remember when I was converted, suddenly being confronted with the fact that I belonged with them. And I remember it dawned on me, I actually want to be with them. And it was a very strange sensation. Like, how could that be? That was God's work, isn't it? That's God's grace. You can't explain it yourself. I want to identify with the people I once thought were stupid and foolish and laughable. What is the affection of Christ towards his church that it should be in us? Ephesians 5, turn there please. Look at verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. When he shepherds his people by his word, he's washing us. that he might present her to himself a glorious church. And I think to myself, and by the way, this isn't a comment for this particular church, but I think of the church. We offer anything but glorious to you. A glorious church, you'd be doing, you look at a bunch, a bunch of ragabonds that we are, you know, and, 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 <coughs> and yet this is his long for us. Present us to him, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, for he, he who loves his wife loves himself. And loving one another we love ourselves because we're all one body. And when one body suffers, the whole one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And one of the members is absent, everyone should grieve their absence and feel their absence there's always consequences we are a body we are one body of different parts Christ is our head verse 29 no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church the Lord cherishes us the Lord nourishes us how I yearn for you all with the affection that is in Christ Jesus. Do you feel this way towards the church? Do you want her to be pure and holy? And Paul says, I long for you with the affection. That's in there too. I long for all the things that Christ longs for. <coughs> your purity, your holiness, your, your blamelessness, your spiritual fruitfulness your presence and your nearness to God. What a challenge this is to me as a pastor. What a challenge this is to us all. But as we saw from the reading in Ephesians 3, this is something that God, the Holy Spirit, must do in us. And to the degree to which we have attained, we can simply man practice. Allow me to close this applications. One. We are to pray for both a sound and a loving ministry. Now, a lot of attention today, and this is good, it's, I'm glad it's being emphasised more than it has been in the past, is given to the need for sound ministry. Not everywhere. But we must not think that it's okay to have sound ministry without a loving heart. Um, it is possible to preach sound doctrine without this heart that Paul describes, this, this yearning for the people of God, this longing for the things that Christ wants for his people. That being said, some churches make a mistake and think, oh, he is definitely a loving minister. Oh, he speaks with such gentle tones and his voice is so lovely and he has lots of cups of tea with me, by the way, nothing on part of a cup of tea as prisoners. But, but, you know, he's just, he's just among us all the time and he, but he preaches error. Speaking to someone recently about a pastor in the church in Eastbourne, they said, Oh, he's a great pastor because he comes out bike riding with us and he does all these things. He's really one of the group. He's a friend, he's a buddy. There was no mention of, we know he loves us because he studies the word, he prays for our souls, 
he brings a word from the altar of prayer before us. You see, one can sound loving without being loving. One can preach error in a loving tone. Nevertheless, the ideal is sound doctrine and a loving heart. Now, in one sense, you can never know for sure. That's why Paul had to say, but God is my witness. He, they can't see what's in his heart. And, uh, but it's something that at the very least to be praying for, that whoever preaches in this pulpit, if I'm killed next week, whoever preaches in this pulpit, whoever serves, to pray they would do so in love. And that, of course, will mean speaking the truth in love. And sometimes the truth is not always easy to hear. But hear the truth. Hear it from a heart of love. Secondly, we are to lovingly care, love and care for one another as Christ does. We are to seek in one another what Christ seeks in us. Um, we should be praying for one another's holiness. We should be speaking the word of God to one another, speaking a word in season to one another. Uh, we should be trying to cultivate in one another the things that please him. That is what it is to long for, for us all with the affection that is in Christ Jesus. We should seek to go after the wandering sinners. We should seek to speak a word of admonishment to the wayward. We should speak a word of encouragement to the weary. We should seek to do all those things, all the one another's, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you, show hospitality to one another, be tender-hearted to one another, be kind to one another, pray for one another, etc., etc. Wouldn't that change the fellowship, or wouldn't that be a witness to an isolated post-COVID culture? James Montgomery Boyce, how top have you heard of him? Okay. This is a challenge, isn't it? He says, it's not just enough to tolerate other Christians. You must enjoy their own company. Paul says, I long for you all. Christ longs for us all. He doesn't sort of go around the congregation and go, I'd like your presence and your presence. You can have five minutes, ten minutes, an hour. He longs for us all. He longs for all of our companies. We're prone, aren't we, to see the blots and blemishes in one another. I have mentioned Song of Solomon when the bride says, I am dark, but Christ says, but lovely. Let's try to view one another as Christ sees us. Let's try to view and relate one another to the high calling to which we've been called. Sister in Christ, brother in Christ, father in Christ, mother in Christ. It will change the way we deal with one another. We are called to love without partiality for you all, he says. Not those with whom he just has things in common. And I have to say, I think this statement, what I'm making this application, is a, a very, very appropriate and relevant one to the reformed church in this country. So often fellowship after church is people going to their normal clip. And I'm not saying like, this has happened here, I'm just saying I have seen it happen. Same people talk with the same people every week, and it's the people they also spend all week doing. And they have the feeling that they're having fellowship together, when the truth is the same people are isolated and ignored and overlooked every single week. That is not longing and loving with the affection that is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus had time for those society had cast out. There is no click with Paul. I remember there's pastors who only spoke to the pastors and the elders. And they only socialised with the elders. And they only went on holiday with the elders. And I long for you all. The weak in faith, the unstable in faith, the poor in spirit, whoever and whatever they were, if they were a follower of Christ in Philippi, he looked forward to seeing them. He longed for their good. I think that's a very challenge, isn't it, to us all in these days. Fourthly, we must be acquainted with the heart of Christ. As I said, this, this doesn't just happen. To love people as Christ loved people, we need to regularly be thinking and contemplating on the love of Christ, right? It's only insofar as we apprehend his love that we will be enabled to love. That we freely we have received and freely we give. You can't give this kind of love in a vacuum. 
It's something that must flow out of something that's coming in. Here was Paul was a man who never forgot, who never forgot the Lord's mercy. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus saves sinners. And he never stopped saying that without skipping. It is those who view their sin little, who have a small view of God, who view his sacrifice lightly, that will love little. Fifthly, and lastly, we must be committed to the Church of Christ. I did touch on this this morning, just want to just hone in on it again now as we close this section of Philippians. Christ's love for his people was a covenant love. Before the foundation of the world, he was given a people, a set of names, unworthy and undeserving as they were, and he had to pledge and agree and covenant to save them. That covenant was not ratified and formalised until Calvary, when he sealed the covenant, he signed the agreement with his blood. He put his heart, his heart, soul and his body on the line. He didn't just say, I love these people, he gave himself for these people. He committed himself to the ultimate extent. He pledged himself to Calvary. He identified himself with us in his baptism by becoming sin for us and rising again. And therefore, to long for you all with the affection that is in Christ Jesus, for us to do that to one another, we must covenant together. We must express our sole commitment to one another's good in Christ. We must be joined as one body in Christ. The Lord, the New Testament knows of no such Christianity which has Christians outside of commitment to a local church. And so I, I, I put that to you, if that applies to you, not to chide you, but to actually invite you into one of the most wonderful phenomena in the world. Yeah, the union of Christ and his people. Christ shepherds his people as his people are a people as they're gathered together. The fact that it says to the church at Philippi means there was a defined people at Philippi. There were names, there was a list. I mean, one of the most stupid straw man arguments you hear today against church membership is I see no mention of a membership list in the New Testament. This is where we have to learn to read our Bible and draw out principles. To the church at Philippi, it means that there was, in a way, a recognition that there were people at Philippi who made up the church of Philippi, and they were recognisable, definable. They had bishops, they had deacons. In fact, when it even says that in Corinthians, if this person sinned, then he's not repentant, he needs to be put out of the church, it implies that there are lines, there are those who are in and those who are not in. It, Acts 2, there were... You know, 3,000 believed and they were added. Added to what? Added to the church. And so, these are things then. To long for you all, to practice this requires that we are with his people. And oh, what blessing there is to come in together with Christ. There's no danger there, there's no harm there, just safety. You're to be under his shepherding under his care, under his love. What a blessing it is to be there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, oh, we feel so, well, I feel so wretched in one sense as I consider the affection of Christ for his people. Who among us, who is sufficient for these things? Who among us can love like that? And yet Paul did. And he was just a man of like passions as we are. He was once a God, Christ, hating sinner. We read of Epaphroditus, another one. A Gentile, a lost idolater, who risked his life for the cause of Christ. Oh Lord, we do pray that you might help us to apprehend your love for us. And that in so far as we comprehend these things, and you strengthen us to do so, 
we might be strengthened to love one another like that. Forgive our shortcomings, O oh Lord, but we have heard this evening this great high calling and it inspires us and it, and it draws us out to him. And so we would pray, O oh Lord, that in this church at Eastbourne, we'd be filled with your love and having experienced your love, we would love one another all to the glory of Christ in the church in every age. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. O love of God, how strong and true, eternal and yet ever in ever new, uncomprehended and unbought, beyond all knowledge and all thought.